I'm Greg Fleming, the Chief Executive Officer of Rockefeller Capital Management. And I'm here today with Rashir Sharma, Chairman of Rockefeller International, a leading global fund manager, renowned expert on emerging nations, and best-selling author. Rashir is really known for his ability to peer into the future and articulate what he believes will be most important to watch out for in his yearly top 10 trends list. His predictions have been uncanny at times and demonstrate a broad and deep understanding of the world and global markets. We're excited to get his perspective on the year to date and his outlook entering the latter half of 2024. Rashir recently published his latest book, What Went Wrong With Capitalism, a brilliantly written set of compelling arguments, not against capitalism, but what needs to be done to let it work as intended. As part of this discussion, we'll also unpack some of that. Rashir, welcome. Thanks, Craig. It's great Thank to you. see you. Yeah, so we're thanks. about halfway through the year, and I mentioned in the intro your ability, uncanny ability to call the future. What has surprised you this year so far in terms of markets? What's different, and what are you most focused on for the second half of 2024? I think the biggest surprise, if I were to look at it, is just the persistence of how well the U.S. economy seems to be doing, especially at a headline level, which is that I think now it's been seven to eight quarters where the economy has grown at a rate of 2% or more. Now, of course, I do believe that it has been artificially stimulated a lot. As I wrote a piece for the Financial Times a few weeks ago, that it seems like an overstimulated superpower, which is that if you look at the amount of both fiscal and monetary stimulus that is still working its way through the economy, it's quite incredible. And I think that that's a major reason why inflation's been a bit stickier and also why asset prices have done so well. If you look at stocks or property and stuff, there's just so much liquidity that the Fed had pumped after the uh, pandemic. So much of this stimulus was still in the economy that I think a lot of that money is still working its way through and why a lot of the Fed's interest rate increases haven't really written as yet. So I think that's a very important reason, plus the fiscal stimulus, the fact that the government spending last year, in fact, by some estimates, may have accounted for as much as one third of the total growth of the U.S. economy wow. may have come from just government spending. So these are serious impulses. But the fact is that the U.S. economy for now is doing much better than any of us uh, expected. First of all, the fiscal beat just goes on, and I'm not sure what's going to cause that to stop. I mean, right. we have an election. We'll see if, if either party after the election reigns that in. Um, but at some point, uh, Jimmy Chang, our chief investment officer, calls it the sugar high, the 20 to 24 sugar high. At some point, if, if that starts to come off, are you concerned about where the U.S. economy goes then? Yeah, I think there are two concerns. One, of course, is the fact that uh, as the sugar high comes off, you could get a sudden drop in economic activity. You don't know how this sort of plays out. A lot of the traditional models have already not worked in this cycle. So I think that's one. And the second, of course, is just the financing need, that the amount of funding that the U.S. government needs now with interest payments, matching the payments on defense uh, and other key items in the budget, the amount of funding that the U.S. government needs, the supply coming out of the Treasury is incredible. And when do we reach a moment where the bond market Already yields are much higher than they used to be, but when does the bond market start to really revolt and say, we just can't handle this amount of supply? Uh, so I think that that's, those are two concerns that I have. Very hard to pinpoint when exactly it happens, but those have to be two concerns because if something can't go on forever, it won't. I, because the fact of the matter today is that the U.S. is running a budget deficit now, which is way higher than any other developed country in the world. Our debt burden now is getting to levels which is comparable to only maybe a Japan or Italy. So these are very seriously high numbers that the U.S. is running. And can we keep running a budget deficit of 6% of GDP as the CBO estimates uh, for the foreseeable future without any consequences? I just don't know. When the Fed's deliberating, are they focused on the amount of the, the debt that it's got to be financed, the cost of it? Or are they supposed to ignore that and set policy around inflation and employment? I think the, the latter, that they are quite focused on what they think is their immediate objective, which is that, okay, how's inflation, how's employment? They currently are slightly concerned that inflation has been stickier than what it should be, but the unemployment situation still appears pretty good in terms of if you look at the labor markets, they are relatively tight. Some easing has taken place in labor markets, but they're relatively tight. So the Fed is quite happy to just do nothing for now. 
and uh, it's hard to see as to what will shake them out of that. So, but I do feel the fact that, that the Fed at some point in time, and this is one of the topics that we'll speak about, which I mentioned in the book, that why is the Fed only focused on consumer price inflation? Why not even asset price inflation? And just look at the consequences of that. There are so many young people who feel completely out of the property market because you've had such a massive increase in property prices that's taken place as well, uh, which is not counted, ob obviously, any traditional inflation statistics. So I think that there's something about that, that this asset price inflation, particularly in housing prices, hurts a lot of people, uh, but the Fed doesn't take that into account. It's very straight and narrow, focused on unemployment, focused on classic consumer price inflation. And you think when you, you know, those are their main focus, but remember all the way back to Greenspan with the rational exuberance and he was trying to maybe talk asset prices down. This is almost 30 years ago. It, do you think there is concern at the Fed when they, because uh, what you're talking about, asset price inflation, it's literally, I was talking to the CEO of a, of a major, you know, asset management firm the other day, and they were talking about uh, inflation and asset prices in every single asset class. In fact, so does does that factor into the the I mean does the Fed talk about that because it is I mean Greenspan did and it is as you said related yeah but Greenspan is also the person in fact going back to who were who sort of introduced this very asymmetric relationship that the Fed has with financial markets which is that Greenspan briefly spoke about that back in 1996 but he quickly walked away from it and the Fed's relationship with asset markets is pretty simple which is that. We will not, uh, their sort of approach is, we don't know when a bubble is happening, so we're not going to do anything when asset prices are rising. But if asset prices fall, they're there to provide uh, liquidity and to, you know, provide some sort of a put. Do you still believe most likely the next leg is down? You have more people coming out now talking about maybe the next leg is up, even given what Powell said last time he spoke? Rates in general, I think, are likely to remain higher for longer. I keep saying that. And that's partly also because of the discussion we've had about the fiscal situation, that even the U.S. economy were to, let's say, have a recession, I just don't see rates coming down that much in the cycle compared to what they did in the past, because the funding needs have gone up. Today, the U.S., despite being at full employment, is running a budget deficit of 6% of GDP. Can you imagine a recession, what those numbers would look like? We'd be very quickly up to 8, 9, 10%. Percent, yeah. yeah, so how are we going to be able to get rates to come down, particularly at the long end, when the funding is going to keep going up. So I just don't see rates coming down that much in any scenario. Well, let me ask you about that, though. I mean, uh, the fiscal uh, uh, deficit is 6% of GDP now, as you're saying, close to full employment. If, un if unemployment ticks up and, and things seem to soften, how soft can they get if the government's willing to run a fiscal deficit? I mean, classic Keynesian economics would say you can't have a recession then. Is it if we keep spending at this level, does it become almost a little more recession-proof? No, I think that in terms of what happens here is the fact that the government's ability to spend or to rescue the economy in the yeah. next downturn yeah. will be much more compromised now because it's pretty much spent all its bullets in a way. Of course, they keep coming up with new uh, bullets to try and uh, do that, and that's the progression of government's intervention in the economy, which we'll speak about. But I think that the problem is going to be that the next downturn there just isn't any ammunition left because you're starting from a full employment budget deficit of 6% of GDP. I know that you're also upbeat on American innovation in the face of all of this. So some of this is down to the fact that uh, the American business sector and innovation and AI is driving the economy in a positive way. In, it, so it's not just the, the fiscal and monetary situation, but it is the, you know, some of the positives of the American economy. Yes. So if I... When I look at any economy, then this is the framework that we develop, that we look at 10 factors, right? You don't just right. focus on one or two. And America has a lot going for it. In fact, when I wrote my first book, as you know, Breakout Nation, the basic thesis of that book, and I wrote that 10, 12 years ago, um, yeah. was the fact that the true breakout nation in the world is America. Just because, of, But at that point in time, I think that the situation was very different. I think that what's happened over time is that, yes, America is great tech innovative engine keeps firing, but the problems and fault lines that have developed in the last few years are much more concerning to me. Because now, even if you look at the tech space, it's so dominated by just a few companies. That's just not true capitalism. You need a lot many more companies to be coming up rather than concentration and domination to be this high. You're one of the uh, first people to talk about all the elections this year. So 
you know, we're almost halfway through. Any major surprises, impact on global economies, and what about the second half of the year? So the basic trend that I wrote about there was that, okay, you got lots of elections, but the incumbent, wherever the incumbents there, especially in the developed world, is likely to be in trouble. And that's because there's so much disaffection that people have with the economy in terms of they're just dissatisfied in terms of how the, uh, what they're getting out of the economy. So I think that that's the big risk, which is that in America and in much of the Western world, for so many years, the incumbent usually had the advantage. They had the bully pulpit, they had the advantage of being reelected. The big change that's taken place uh, is the fact that now whoever the incumbent is, the odds are greater that the incumbent loses than wins. Everywhere, not just everywhere. The States. Exactly. So I think that because the approval ratings of leaders around the world today, especially in the developed world, is close to record lows. So that's the real challenge, I think, of elections today, that incumbents find it difficult to get reelected. What could shift that back? Because classically, if you look at the American economy without taking a, a position on either either side, when you're close to full employment and asset prices are as high as they are, and you know the economy at least continues to grow and on paper looks great, the incumbent never loses, right? The fact that the election's clearly going to be close and the incumbent could lose is is different. One of the things I'm emphasizing uh, when I talk to people about the uh, the book, which is fantastic, is that um, he, he's asking the question and he diagnoses it, but he you know he still believes in the in both the U.S. and in, and and in capitalism. What he's saying is we better get back to it. What I say in the book is this, which is that, yes, the, the U.S. economy at the surface looks fine. But you look at the polls today. What do the polls tell you? Which is that uh, most Americans today feel that they are not going to be earning more than their parents. Big shift from what happened because, you know, uh, for much of post-independence uh, or post-war history, rather, America was concerned, in fact, up to 70 to 80 percent or people thought that they would be much better than their uh, parents. Is this the first time in, yeah. history, in American history since World War II? They, yeah, that, it's, a, it's a secular decline that's been taking place, and it's accelerated in the last 10 or 20 years. So, so you have this feeling here that a lot of people, that the average American feels that they're going to be worse off. This is an intergenerational mindset shift, that they're going to be worse off. And then you look, look at the data further in terms of, I think that you have, Around two thirds of the people in America who want radical change today to the economic system. They're not happy with the economic system. Then also a feeling that there's a lack of opportunity, that if you look at economic and social mobility in America, it's all declined. That in America, it was considered this, that you could get up and go where you wanted to get a good job. You could uh, rise up the uh, uh, career ladder and, and do well. There's a sense of uh, that that doesn't happen anymore. So. All the data shows that economic and social mobility in America has declined. We have record levels of inequality. And you speak about ri rising asset prices, but remember that that helps a very narrow section of society because it's the top, you know, 1% or so which owns the bulk of the assets. Yeah. And then a lot of people, in fact, when it comes to property in particular, feel left out of the property market because asset prices have gone up so much that they can't afford to buy their first home as well. So these are some of the deep issues that we have in America today as to why you have at the surface reasonably good economic growth. And yet it's a situation where so many people in America, a vast majority, think that the country is headed in the wrong economic direction. At a time when by all the you know, absolute measures, uh, the vast majority of people should be concluding otherwise with the low unemployment, with the growth with uh, you know all of the positives that seem to exist in the data, when you're looking at causes for that, yeah, and one of the thrusts of the book, and then you, and you say this accelerated in the pandemic, is the government both spending and overreach in the economy, which you track in the book, way back, and say it's been an inexorable tide, literally since the 50s and 60s, unchecked, irrespective of which administration's in office, of increasing government spending, increasing government involvement increasing government regulation and really the, you know, more of a shackling around capitalism. But I'll, I'll you know, you, you, you choose the words. That's the, you know, how I read the book. Yeah, because so much mind space today goes in the fact that, okay, what's government spending as a share of the uh, economy? And that was, as I've shown in the book in the last hundred years, 
it's gone from 3% to to 36% in America. What's the government's share in the economy? But that's just one aspect. And, and on that, can you talk a little bit about 3% 100 years ago, 36% today, but it's it's been somewhat logarithmic, right, in the more recent years. What was it in 1970, 2000, and today? In fact, it, that's been a steady progression. Oh, so that's more like a, okay. Yeah, uh, that's been a steady progression. What's changed is how it's funded. Because in the 1950s uh, uh, and 60s, we did not run persistent deficits. So you had enough of revenue to match the spending. Now the spending has kept on going up, but the revenues haven't kept up. So you, that's why you have deficit funding. But what I argue in the book is that it's not just government spending, it's the suite of government habits. So what do I mean here? You spoke about regulation. Every year in recent decades, the American government adds 3,000 new regulations. And the number of regulations that is actually withdrawn is a total of 20. This makes it so difficult for a new business to come up and set up because it's so onerous to try and deal with so many regulations and very costly as well. So it, it's a big advantage to the big players and it's a disadvantage to the small players. So that is an argument in favor of the uh, incumbents. Remember, regulation tends to be pro-incumbent. And I think that that's one of the issues we have. The second, as I say in the book, is this entire culture of bailouts. Now bailouts have become common. Every time you have... A, the minor ruffle takes place in the markets or anyone, everyone wants a bailout. And so if you look at it, the number of bankruptcies in America today are also at a record low. How do you end up getting a cleansing of the system if you don't allow any of that to happen? And there are consequences of this because that doesn't allow new businesses to come in. It, it chokes them. So therefore, one of the aspects I deal in the book is if you look at the number of zombie companies in America today, these are companies which were three years or more haven't made enough profits to really pay their interest. So they have to keep on going and borrowing from the market to keep alive. And this is something which we have seen much more now in terms of how many more zombie companies we have in America today. Today, by some measures, one out of five companies in America today can be classified as zombie companies. What was that number in the 1990s? Less than 5%, 2 or 3% or something like that. So you have an increase in zombie companies, you have increased concentration at the top, and you have a vast middle that feels getting squeezed out. The sense of lack of opportunity, because for me, capitalism is what? It's not equality of outcome. You'll always have inequality in a capitalist system, but it's supposed to be inequality on the back of meritocracy. But when you have inequality on the back of lack of opportunity or a feeling of that, that's what leads to frustration. And that's where you're saying uh, the, the high percentage of people who are frustrated today, despite the, the measures that seem to say things are going well. Let's, um, I want to come back to the, your, your uh, solution for the United States. But before we go there, who's implementing capitalism in, in the way that it was intended? What countries can you point to? Yeah. So as far as America is concerned, as I said, that I still feel that this is, you know, like a place that I've long admired. The fact that even in America, I mean, I came originally from India and the fact that if you look at the leading Forbes companies today, uh, one out of 10 are of Indian origin, the CEOs. So it's still a place which has got a lot going for it. But obviously, I'm concerned by the drift that's taken place and where we are today and how the pendulum has swung over the last 100 years systematically. But still in the book, I have an entire chapter of where capitalism is still working and gives us hope. For example, the richest country in the world is Switzerland. And I find that they get the balance correct between how much government to do, what should government spending be the share of GDP, what should taxes be, how much government should be involved. I think they get the balance uh, much more correct than, uh, than most countries do. Then I speak about countries such as Taiwan or even Vietnam, a former communist country, that what they all show you is that if you give people more economic freedom, generally they end up creating a better opportunity for themselves and those economies do better. So my whole concept here about capitalism is about giving people economic freedom so they have the initiative to take and for the government to play a role. We can't go back to the 19th century laissez-faire capitalism where there's no welfare state or something. And of course not. We need a welfare state. We need a support system. But how do you get the balance back? So that's the chapter which sort of gets into that argument. That how do you get the balance back? Uh, in terms of having the light touch of government, which is required, a welfare state, and yet having your priorities correct. Otherwise, you're going to end up having a system where at the top, everything may look okay, but there's so much frustration at the bottom that 
people are going to keep voting out the incumbents. They're going to be frustrated by what happens. And this path will continue. How do we restore faith in capitalism in the U.S.? Well, unfortunately, here's the bad news that unless you get a crisis, there, no government ever reforms uh, in terms of that. So it's literally when the government runs out of options, runs out of money, it's only then that you end up getting reform. So I think that I don't see a way out uh, in terms of this, which is that unless you end up getting a some sort of a crisis which forces people to carry out reform. Because if you, even if you look at uh, some of the most spendthrift countries uh, like Sweden or something, Sweden tried this, you know, spending your way to economic prosperity model. It went nearly bankrupt in the 1990s. It course corrected, but it, uh, in the 2007, 2008 global financial crisis, it entered the crisis, in fact, with a budget surplus nearly. So I think that unless you get a crisis, even the most spendthrift nations, and particularly one is America, where the resources are incredible, where you know it's the world's uh, reserve currency, the world's preeminent nation, there's unlikely to be a major course correction. Sure, we can think about what may happen and stuff, and there's already talk about the regulatory burden and how that needs to reduce. There is increased chatter about the fact that the budget deficit is really too high. We need some entitlement reform. But my uh, unfortunate suspicion here is that unless you get a crisis at the government level, it's unlikely to change anything. The problem I feel often in America today is that if you look at the solution that a lot of people offer, it's more government. How are you going to pay for these things when you're already running? You it, 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 and, and also on the business side, the government stepped in on lots of industries with yes. you know with significant amount of investment that goes into the trillions. Exactly. Right. So, you yeah. know the the, uh, the the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, as always, uh, fantastic to have you here and, and also to have you pushing the envelope on a debate that needs to happen in our country, uh, which we both love so, so much. Uh, congratulations on the book. Thank you. Uh, and as you know, I always close and uh, our, uh, our listeners will know, I always close with a quote. And in this case, I picked one uh, from your book, which is actually the last sentence of the book. So Rashir says in the last sentence of the book, quote, capitalism is still humanity's best hope for economic and social progress, but only if it's free to work. So as always, thanks for joining me. I thanks look forward to seeing you. I'll see you next January for the next top 10. Yes, we'll be uh, here. Great, great nice to see you. you.